The screams and shots come from 286 Bushwallow Crescent. Frantic neighbors find security on duty at the gate. Minutes later, the South African Police Service arrive on the scene. Among a number of people on the crime scene, they find a distraught man without a shirt and pants soaked in blood. They notice he has prosthetic legs. As they walk into the house, they come across the body of a young woman lying at the bottom of a staircase in a pool of blood. She has wounds on her body as well as to her head. There's a trail of blood on the staircase. They follow it up the stairs. On the way up, they notice extensive bloodstained patterns on the wall. There's blood on the railings of the staircase and on the walls and floor upstairs. They follow the blood down a passage, through a small television lounge and into a bedroom. In the bedroom there is a duvet lying on the floor with a pair of inside out jeans on top of it. There is a fan in front of an open door to a balcony. They notice blood spatter on the watch case. There are also small blood stains elsewhere in the room. A passage leads to a bathroom. In the passage there is a 9mm gun casing. In the entrance to the bathroom they see blood drops and wood splinters. They round the corner into a small bathroom. There they are confronted with a bloody scene. There are pools of blood and debris on the floor. The door of a toilet cubicle has been broken down. Near the two hand basins there is a blood smear on the wall. The bathroom window is open. A magazine rack is visible in the toilet cubicle and various objects are on the floor. There is a cricket bat, two cell phones and a silver pistol on the bathroom mat. There is blood and smear marks in the bathroom and in the toilet. In the cubicle they notice that the toilet is streaked with blood. There is a large amount of blood in the toilet bowl. Back downstairs, the police find some blood spatter on furniture in a lounge under the stairs. And in the kitchen, on one of the counters, they find a gift-wrapped item with a card addressed in a woman's neat handwriting to Ozzy. It is Valentine's Day 2013. The bloodied man on the scene was none other than superstar disabled athlete Oscar Pistorius. At the time of the shooting, Pistorius was at the pinnacle of a spectacular career. The darling of the world media, traveling the globe, running at events and appearing in talk shows. He was also in a three-month relationship with South African model Riva Steenkamp. Pistorius admitted to shooting her through a locked toilet cubicle door because he mistook her for an intruder. Realizing a mistake, he then broke down the door with a cricket bat, dragged her out of the cubicle and gently carried her downstairs. He insisted that it was all an accident. However, many experts and investigators who have studied the crime scene say there is another narrative that becomes apparent when the forensic evidence is allowed to speak. And this narrative is one that points to a deliberate killing and no accident. Dr. Judy Melinek is a forensic pathologist who did her training at the New York City Medical Examiner's Office and wrote several books on forensic pathology. Overall, looking at the crime scene photos and the information that was available about what the house looked like when the investigators first arrived, there are some very concerning features at the crime scene. There is blood spatter and smear that's going on the walls all the way down the staircase and her body's at the bottom of the staircase. The incident, which is the shooting, appears to have occurred in a locked bathroom stall that is now destroyed or partially destroyed by a cricket bat, which is also at the scene. There's blood all through the residence going from the bathroom, even smears in the bedroom and down towards the living area that really cannot be explained sufficiently by the scenario that was initially described by Mr. Pistorius. And Dr. Melinek is not alone in this belief. Other experts agree. 
about half of the evidence matches his story and about half doesn't. And it's the discrepancies between Oscar Pistorius' version of events and what the forensic evidence suggests that makes this one of the most intriguing murder cases. A case that is to this day generating more questions than answers years after the event. Pistorius was arrested on the scene and taken to a nearby police station. The news spread like wildfire. Within an hour the international trucks had already parked outside Oscar Pistorius' house and the local media were gathering. Um, it, it, it had the pace that I've never seen a story take in South Africa. You, you know, the, the, the CNN skies, BBCs were going live from outside Oscar Pistorius' estate um, within hours of this incident taking place. So you, the global focus was on the story from the very beginning. Pistorius was held in custody for five days while the police investigated further and his lawyer prepared an application for bail. Five days after the shooting, Pistorius appeared in a lower court in Pretoria for the bail application. It was a media circus. Yes, well, he, he, um, he initially pleaded not guilty, obviously, to the charges that were put to him in the bail application, but he also made a statement. The shooting took place on the upper floor of Pistorius' home. This is the outlay of the master bedroom and bathroom. The bed is against one wall and on the right of the bed there's a sliding door that opens onto a small balcony. A passage from the bedroom leads to the bathroom where there's a bathtub opposite two hand basins. There's a window in the bathroom, a shower stall and a toilet cubicle that has a solid wooden door. The story's version of events was that he and Riva went to bed peacefully at about 10 in the evening and slept soundly. He slept on the left hand side of the bed and she on the right hand side. Pistorius said that he woke up at about 3 a.m. and realized that the door to the balcony next to the bed was still open. There was also a fan standing in the open door. He says he got up, brought in the fan and closed the door. He also closed the drapes and it was pitch dark inside. He then heard a sound in the bathroom and thinking it was an intruder opening a window, he got his gun and went to the bathroom on his stumps, shouted and saw that there is nobody in the bathroom. He said he heard a sound in the toilet cubicle and fired four shots through the closed door. We went back to the bedroom, found that Riva was not there and then realized that she must have gone to the toilet while he was bringing in the fan and that it was she who was behind the door. He then put on his prosthetic legs, went to the bathroom, broke the door down with the cricket bat and he found Riva slumped over the toilet. He said he then called out for help, dragged her from the cubicle picked her up gently and carried her downstairs and put her down at the bottom of the staircase. He said it was all a horrible, tragic mistake. Right from the start the police did not accept this version and contended that the shooting was no accident and accused Pistorius of murder. They believed there was a fight that night and that it got out of hand. They say Pistorius then chased Riva into the bathroom. She locked herself inside the toilet cubicle and in a fit of rage, Pistorius fired the fatal shots through the door. Based on their version of events, the state opposed Pistorius' bail application. However, right from the start, the state had to contend with exceptionally poor police work at the crime scene. What had emerged during the bail application is that uh, Hilton Buerta, the investigating officer, uh, who was ultimately in charge of the crime scene, they were entering the crime scene without the required uh, booties or you know the cloth that they would put over their shoes to ensure a crime scene isn't contaminated which in itself then raises questions over the handling of the crime scene. We all were made aware of the fact that Hilton Boerter, the initial investigating officer, had, had really uh, not acquitted himself well uh, when attending to the crime scene and this was the evidence that, that came out during the bail application. It was clear that the crime scene was not secured properly. Two very expensive watches were stolen by the police. In this photograph, taken at around 6 a.m., all the watches were in place. A few hours later, this photograph was taken, and one watch was missing. A little later, another watch had gone. Nobody was accountable for it. The first police ballistic expert, a Colonel Motta, also made an inexcusable mistake by handling the murder weapon without gloves, because it was lying cocked on the floor. An incomprehensible action. And the police investigators missed crucial pieces of evidence on the scene that defense experts later recovered. 
Ik denk dat is na aanleiding van uh, opmerking wat uh, Dr. Reggie Purmel gemaakt het, dat hij vermoed dat moet nog ergens een koel en uh, op die toneel wees. Ik weet niet hoe komt hij dit gemaakt niet, maar ik heb het teruggegaan in de enigste plek waar ik kon gedenken dat nog een koel moet wees, is binnen in die toilet. En ik heb maar beschermde handschoenen aangetrek, toilet gekrap en hier die koel toe uitgekom. In addition, an Apple computer present on the scene that could have contained vital evidence was not taken away for examination. Only cell phones and iPads were removed. Some evidence removed from the scene was badly handled. For example, the door, an absolute crucial piece of evidence, was removed from the scene in pieces in a body bag. On the reassembled door, one can see where the pieces were carelessly stepped upon by the police. Further, key elements of Pistorius' version that could have been checked on the scene were simply not investigated. The forensic investigations that could have been performed in this case would have made the state's case so much easier to prove in court. Many aspects that uh, um, should have been followed up with and many investigations that should have been done were just not done for whatever reason. A lot of sound evidence that would have been crucial to this case was never even collected or brought as evidence before the court. For instance, why was there never any evidence brought to court about what sound the door made when Reva closed it? What sound the door made when she locked it? And more importantly, why did Oscar not hear that prior to him firing shots through the door? Even the smallest sound of her moving the bed sheets, her getting out of bed, maybe the sound of bed springs should have brought, been brought as evidence to court. And it never was. You would have thought that given the high profile nature, they would have employed the highest degree of professionalism. That didn't happen. This bungling by the police was revealed in detail at the bail hearing and caused serious doubt about the quality of the investigation and the treatment of the forensic evidence. But in the end, Pistorius was granted bail, even though the state felt that he was a flight risk. The, the defense had successfully convinced the court that he was not a flight risk, that he would attend court until the matter was finalized, that he would not pose a danger to uh, the society and also not a danger to the administration of, of the justice system in South Africa. After Pistorius was released on bail, both sides started to prepare for trial. A court date was set for the 3rd of March 2014 in the North Gauteng High Court in Pretoria, and a judge was appointed. The start of the trial again made international headlines. In a first for South Africa, permission was obtained to broadcast the trial live on television. It was the first time that that the Joe Soap out there and, and the public could see what the inside of a court looks like, what the judge wears, how proceedings work inside a, a court. And I think from that aspect, it was phenomenal in, in uh, you know, making society more aware of our justice system. I, I, was, I covered the trial from day one until the very last day. I, I went through, sat through the entire matter. Um, Chock-a-block courtroom, uh, reporters outside from around the world, crossing live on the hour, every hour. Um, the entire Madiba Street in front of the High Court in Pretoria was packed full of uh, international vans. The trial judge was Judge Tukasile Masipa, assisted by two assessors. In South Africa, there are no jury trials. Pistorius was charged with murder in that he unlawfully and intentionally killed Riva Steenkamp. He was also charged on three other counts relating to reckless handling of firearms and possessing ammunition without a license. On the 3rd of March 2014, Judge Masipa put the charges to him. I understand the charges, Mr. Pistorius? I do, I do, my lady. How do you plead? Not guilty, my lady. Thank you. Well, Oscar pleaded not guilty to the charge that was put to him, but he gave quite an elaborate uh, a plea in, you know, in his plea explanation, as, as they refer to it. Um, and not only did he state that he was not guilty, he actually challenged the veracity of the evidence, or you know, he challenged it saying that he will prove that the crime scene had been tampered with, and pretty much putting it that he's been framed, um, that this should never have been a murder charge in the first place. Crucial to Nell's case was the fact that he had five ear witnesses. The witnesses testifying through an interpreter agreed to have their voices broadcast, but were not willing to be filmed in court as they gave testimony. 
One of them living in this house across the street from Pistorius said that she heard a man and a woman arguing for about an hour between 2 and 3 in the morning. For the state this proved that Pistorius and Riva were awake and arguing and not sound asleep as Pistorius claimed. The other four ear witnesses, two couples who lived here and here, said they heard a woman scream in terror that night before the shots rang out. They were adamant that they heard a woman screaming and not a man. This is one of them, Mrs. Stipp, testifying. Then, madam, what happened? Die edle net na drie, die ochend het ek wakker geword van een vrou se verskrikkelike gille. My lady, just after three, I woke up uh, from a woman's terrible screams. Se het verskrikkelijk gegil en toe het sal my opgeroep. She screamed terribly and she uh, yelled for help. Then I also heard a man screaming for help. I heard her screams again. I was freeze bevangen geweest. Dit is die ergste. Dit was dus een climax. Ek het al angst gehoor en ek het geweet iets gaan kom. Iets verskrikkeliks gebeur in daar die huis. It was, she was very scared. It was screams that was a climax. Okay. And what happened then? Die edele, na haar gulle, enkele oomlikke naad het die skote geklap, daar was vier skote gewees. Just after her screams, uh, my lady, I heard four shots. Um, it was four shot, uh, gunshots that I heard. There were four shots. You, uh, you said the first. Could you perhaps give us a demonstration by using bum? Dit was die edele, by voorbeeld gewees, bang. Bang, bang, bang. Daar was een groter pose tussen 1 en 2, as tussen 2 en 3 en 3 en 4. There was a, a longer pause between number 1 and 2 than between number 2 and 3 and 3 and 4. These ear witnesses were crucial to the state's case as their testimony could further prove that it was an altercation and that Pistorius knew he was shooting at Riva. Now also focused attention on the testimony by the state's pathologist, Professor Simon. He requested that neither his image nor testimony be broadcast. He dealt with Riva's wounds and also testified that Riva's stomach contents showed that she had eaten two hours or less before the shooting and could thus not have been asleep as the story stated. On the scene, the police took possession of two phones and two iPads. They were able to recover WhatsApp messages between Pistorius and Riva, showing that their relationship was troubled. The police official who recovered the messages but were asked to read I'm some of them some aloud in court. May, uh, now, I'm so upset. I left Darren's party early. So upset. I can't get that day back. I have been upset by you for two days now. I'm scared of you sometimes and how you snap at me and of how you will react to me. When Oscar Pistorius was called to the stand to testify, his cross-examination by Garinel was disastrous for Pistorius. He turned out to be a poor and untruthful witness. Did you aim at the door or point your gun at the door? It's important. I, I pointed my gun at the door, my lady. Okay, then my answer that I struggled to get from you is, did you aim at the door? No. That's the way Mr. Nell put it to me is how I understood it. So that's right, my lady. I didn't aim at the door. Good. I pointed my firearm. Was my firearm was pointed at the door? You heard the sound. What happened there? I fired the. I discharged the firearm, my lady. Why? Because I thought somebody was coming out to attack me. So you wanted to shoot the person coming out. I didn't want to shoot them, my lady. I what did you front. want to do? I didn't have time to think of what no, I wanted no. to do. I was terrified, my lady. You acted in putative self-defense. And I know it's a big word, but I'll try and assist you with that. That you perceived an attack, that you fired at the attacker to kill him, or to ward off the attack. That's not true, am I right? I didn't fire to kill anyone, my lady. Or to ward off an attack. My lady, I didn't have time to think. I, th I heard this noise and I thought it was somebody coming out to attack me, so I fired my firearm. Your, f your defense have now changed, sir. Um, Putative self-defense. 
to involuntary action. Is I that what you're telling I me? I don't understand the law, ma'am. What I can reply and tell the courts is what I'm asked, and I can reply as to what I thought. But I didn't fire to kill anyone, my lady. You fired at Riva. <laughs> I did not fire at Riva. <laughs> I think he was one of the worst witnesses I've ever seen in court. Uh, you know, he, 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 he literally changed his version whilst testifying no less than three occasions. Uh, as I've said, he, he first went from saying that he did not know Riva was behind the door to he d could not remember firing the shots to he had no intention to kill anyone. And once you start contradicting your versions, you make your, your life very difficult. Um, and that is what Harry Nall latched onto. Harry Nall is a is a very experienced and seasoned cross examiner, and he just needs one one small little bit of uh, contradicting evidence, and he he will latch onto it. He was cross examined for for approximately five days, and I think Oscar Pistorius after that his his fate had been sealed. Um, an interesting point is that where when he testified, he was very emotional. He became sick in court. The court constantly had to break in order for him to compose himself and in order for him to, to stop crying and stop vomiting. Um, and that plays a big part, you know, as much as a judge and her assessors needed to remain completely objective and unbiased and not uh, show any emotion towards the accused, there, there is, of course, an effect on a person when a person is testifying in front of them constantly in tears and constantly being emotional. Hold on. He's emotional, my lady. May it's I fine. just ask? It's fine. He, he may be emotional. But you, I, I don't think you can ask him why now. He's been emotional throughout. And in front of a judge that seems sympathetic to towards Pistorius, the state surprised? proceeded to show that Pistorius could be really aggressive no, no, be and had a record of being irresponsible with firearms. Harry like Nell also showed a video published by Sky News in court where Pistorius is on a shooting range and acting out. And in these pictures uncovered by Sky News, the athlete shows his prowess at handling a gun. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Is that when you're ready? You're ready. The video also caught the Pistorius in another lie. He denied knowing what a zombie stopper is, and yet he uses the term in the video. His previous longtime girlfriend also testified that Pistorius does not scream like a woman. This was also crucial to the state's case, as the defense would argue that ear witnesses mistook Pistorius' screams for that of a woman. It is the accused case that at the night he was anxious and he screamed. And it's his case of the incident, the night of the incident, and it's his case, and he had it tested according to him, that if he screams and he's really anxious, he sounds like a woman. That is not true. He sounds like a man. When the state closed its arguments, it seemed that it had a pretty watertight case. However, for many observers, the state's case could have been much, much stronger if the investigation and the prosecution had been more thorough and comprehensive. My first impression when the state closed its case was that I had more questions than answers about this matter. That even less made sense than before the case actually started. I sometimes refer to the O.J. Simpson syndrome where an investigator who has a very strong suspicion or an opinion over who committed an offence um, believes that the, 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 the case against the offender is so strong that it's not necessary to dot the I's and cross the T's in doing 101 investigations. That's exactly what happened. It was common cause who killed Reva. No one argued about that. And I think to a large extent that the investigating officers and forensic scientists that attended the scene relied strongly on the fact that they knew who killed her. They forgot that there is still a burden of proof on the state to show that the accused committed the act of murder. Killing someone per se is not necessarily an offence. The circumstances and the reason why a person is killed uh, makes the difference between an offence or not. 
So many aspects that could have strengthened the state's contention that there was an altercation, or which could have challenged Pistorius' version of events, were simply overlooked or not investigated properly. In addition, many of the police findings actually supported Pistorius' version of events. For example, the police blood spatter expert showed with a mannequin how he believed Pistorius dragged Riva from a cubicle and how he carried her through the house and down the stairs to the bottom of the staircase. He also did not find anything suspicious in the extensive blood spatter visible on the scene. In 2013, 03-11, I received a copy of a written statement as made by Oscar Leonard Carl Pistorius, dated 2013-02-19, made at his bail application, held at the Pretoria Regional Court of Gauteng on the same date from Brigadier Russ. The version of events as set out in the paragraph 16.13 to 16.17 to 7 in the aforementioned statement are consistent with the observed bloodstain patterns. It is my opinion that these events are the most probable and possible explanation for the observed bloodshed. You still stand by that? I do. I have no further questions. Thank you, my lady. The state concluded this case. We say, my lady, it's a state's case that the accused was a deceitful witness. The court should have no difficulty in rejecting his core version of events, not only as not reasonably possibly true, but in essence as being absolutely devoid of any truth. Then it was a chance of the defence, and they came well prepared. This made it possible for the defence to systematically counter everything that the prosecution had argued. They portrayed Pistorius as a scared, disabled person frightened for his life. They paraded Pistorius in court on his stumps to show off his disability and how unsure he is on his stumps. The defence countered the state's contention that the relationship between Pistorius and Riva was troubled by pointing out the number of loving messages exchanged between the two of them. The defence also countered the claims that Riva was awake and eating two hours before the shooting by producing a forensic expert who said it was unlikely, but possible, that eight hours after eating something Riva could still have some stomach contents of that meal. The defence also managed to confuse some of the ear witnesses and said that the witnesses were mistaken and never heard a woman shout. They only heard the story shout and never heard shots but heard the cricket bat breaking down the door. They also produced Pistorius' next door neighbours who testified that they heard only a man screaming. The defence then closed its case. The court adjourned for a few weeks to allow trial judge Masipa and the assessors to consider her verdict. When court resumed and the judge was ready to pass down judgment, it again attracted the world media. But then came a shocker. The judge's verdict was astounded. In a highly controversial ruling, she basically found in favour of Pistorius and rejected the state's case. She rejected the ear witnesses' account as unreliable. She found that the WhatsApp messages were meaningless. She also rejected the state's contention that there was a fight and accepted Pistorius' account of what had happened that night. The accused gave a version which could reasonably possibly be true. There is no basis on which this court could make inferences of why the accused would want to kill the deceased. On count one, murder, the accused is found not guilty and is discharged. Instead, he is found guilty of culpable homicide. Yes, so uh, the, the initial ruling by Judge Masipa was that Oscar Pistorius was only found guilty of culpable homicide. In other words, the negligent, unlawful killing of another person. He had no intent to kill Riva Steenkamp, and he was subsequently sentenced to five years imprisonment, but under a section of our Criminal Procedure Act, which meant that he would only serve one-sixth of that, in other words, ten months uh, uh, of that sentence, or a year of that sentence. The, the state, uh, uh, especially Harinal, was not happy with that decision by Judge Masipa. They were not satisfied that she had made the right decision, and they approached the Supreme Court of Appeal in Bloemfontein uh, on an appeal, saying that the finding of, the, of Judge Masipa was incorrect, that she should have in fact found him guilty of murder, and that the sentence was uh, of course incorrect because it was not in accordance with the crime of murder. The matter then went to the Supreme Court of Appeal in Bloemfontein, where senior judges considered it. 
What then had transpired is that the Supreme Court of Appeal overturned Judge Masipa's decision. Guilty of murder with the accused having had criminal intent in the form of dolus eventualis. And they found Oscar Pistorius guilty of murder, dolus eventualis. In other words, that when he pulled that trigger, he knew that a person could be killed, and not necessarily Riva Stienkam, but a person, that his life was in fact not in danger, that his actions were not justified, but that he reconciled himself with this fact, and he still acted accordingly. He pulled the trigger four times. He caused the, the, the death of an innocent person, and thus they found him guilty of murder with the principles of dolus eventualis, and they sent the matter back to Judge Masipa for resentencing but this time not on the conviction of culpable homicide, but on the conviction of murder. So the court, the, the, the entire matter then went back to the Pretoria High Court for sentencing. Despite being severely criticised by the judges of the appeals court, indicating that she misinterpreted the law, and having her initial ruling overturned, Judge Masiba then delivered another shocking ruling. Instead of the five years for culpable homicide, she sentenced Pistorius to six years on a murder charge. There was outrage among members of the public at this because the minimum prescribed sentence for murder in South Africa is 15 years imprisonment. It's a mandatory sentence unless there are compelling mitigating factors. But instead of 15 years, Masipa gave Pistorius 6 years. The prosecution was again dismayed at this sentence and appealed this second sentence as well, arguing it was shockingly and inappropriately lenient. Again, the matter was heard in the Supreme Court of Appeal in Bloemfontein. The Supreme Court of Appeal found that Oscar Pistorius had showed no substantial and compelling circumstances which forced the court to deviate from a minimum sentence of 15 years of imprisonment um, and that they then overturned that decision of the six years imprisonment and in, instead handed down a sentence of 15 years imprisonment but effectively that Oscar would serve approximately 13 and a half years because of the time that he had already se served in prison. Later, Pistorius approached the Constitutional Court to appeal the sentence, but the court rejected his application in April 2018, and that was it for Oscar Pistorius. He was sent to prison. However, what must be understood is that the Supreme Court of Appeal did not retry Pistorius. They merely reviewed the sentencing. This meant that in the end, the version of events given by Pistorius and as accepted by the trial judge remained the official version of what had happened. However, despite Pistorius being sentenced to 15 years for murder, many people still felt a huge sense of dissatisfaction. They felt Pistorius' version was not the truth and a sanitized version of what happened. They also felt that there was no justice for Riva Steenkamp because under the dualist eventualis ruling, the identity of the victim is irrelevant. During the sentencing phase, Barry Steenkamp, Riva's father, expressed some of the dissatisfaction. He felt his daughter was not deliberately he felt his daughter was deliberately targeted, and that the horror of what Riva went through that night was silenced, and that her voice was ultimately not heard. He spoke in aggravation of sentence and asked for her wounds to speak for her. But what I would like the world to see uh, are the wounds inflicted on Tureva and the pain that she must have gone through. Something has been so carefully and cleverly erased that even Riva's father can't see it, can't feel it. And, you know, his desperate plea to, you know, I mean, just think about it. He loves his daughter. He, he wants to honor her. But none of that matters if, 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 if there's no justice for her. And is he, her own father is even willing to say, let the world see how my daughter's been destroyed. Let the world see how this be my beautiful child's been, um, you know, um, broken and bloodied. Let let people see this. Um, it's a, it's an incredible statement to want to make, you know, out of a place of terrible brokenness and terrible pain. And you know, that's I think why this case is still a problem is the narrative that's out there and the narrative that is not there 
is still nagging. The, the narrative that's not is nagging. The missing narrative is the full story of what happened that night. Many felt it was missing because not all evidence available was brought to court. One glaring oversight in the case had to do with the appearance of the toilet bowl. It was first mentioned in this book by journalists Barry Bateman and Mandy Wiener. Well, going through the crime scene photographs, what we happen to notice is that if you look inside the toilet bowl, you'll see columns of blood. It looks like a candy cane. So you've got this red curtain of blood on the inside of the bowl separated by columns of white where you see the porcelain. And uh, presenting these pictures to experts, um, they've concluded that that is where water has been running. The only way you could have cleared that blood from that particular section is if water was running. Um, and having a look at the photos and, and managed to establish a timeline of events and establish that it could only have been uh, Riva Steenkamp who flushed that toilet. It could never have been after the fact, after Oscar Pistorius got into the bathroom. And essentially what it says is that Riva must have flushed the toilet and within a split second of that noise, Oscar Pistorius must have opened fire. Uh, Riva would have collapsed over the toilet with this devastating head wound, um, leaked blood into the toilet while it was still flushing. Um, but it would have come to the end of the flush where there would have just been those few columns of water still flowing. So it would have filled up the bowl with her blood from her head, but because it was towards the end of the flush, it would have flushed those few columns away um, that uh, created those white lines. That particular evidence was not presented to the court. The question, of course, is why? It is really important evidence. Did it escape the attention of both prosecution and defense? Or was it perhaps deliberately withheld? Well, assuming that they, they were aware of it, um, they wouldn't have presented the evidence because it would have undermined each of their cases. We look at the state's case, for example. They argued that there was a fight between Oscar Pistorius uh, that ultimately led to the shooting. If it shows, if the evidence showed that Rebus Dienkum had flushed the toilet, it would have supported Oscar Pistorius' case that she had, in fact, gone to the bathroom to relieve herself. On the other side, for the defense, if they had presented this particular information, it would have raised further questions over Oscar Pistorius' belief that um, an intruder had broken into, into the house. Because why would the intruder have gone into the bathroom, locked the door, and actually flushed the toilet? It, it just would have uh, created further problems in the defense. If it is the case that both defense and prosecution deliberately withheld this evidence, it would cause serious doubt over the integrity of both prosecution and defense upon whom rests a legal obligation to bring all available evidence to court to consider. The flushing could have been innocent, or it could have constituted tampering with the crime scene. At the very least, Pistorius should have been confronted with it and asked for an explanation. Unanswered and uninvestigated questions seem to arrive whenever the scene is examined in detail. For example, the photos of Riva's face so, released to the uh, media generated that he had serious his questions. Fingers in her mouth to help her breathe, and I'm I'm not quite sure by what mechanism he would help her breathe with his finger in her mouth, or fingers. But he said that his hands were saturated with blood. In fact, he asked the police if he could wash his hands because the smell was making him sick. Yet we don't see any transfer marks on her face from him having touched her face. Uh, we do have a little blood coming from the nose, but nothing around the mouth area. This photo should have raised a question that should have been put to Pistorius. And on the photograph, Riva's face seemed very clean. So it's not really a question that, that Riva's face has been cleaned. You can actually see evidence of blood that with his blood, but, but the blood sort of, it's almost like where a drop of rain has fallen and then the, the drop of rain has evaporated. There's a drop on her eyelid where, where you can see the shape of the, the drop, but, but the drop itself is gone. We know from Oscar's version, we know from the crime scene photos, that Reva was lying on the toilet seat with the right side. Uh, uh, the right side of her, her face was against the toilet seat. And yet when you look at those crime scene photos, there's, there's no blood whatsoever on that side of her face. Um, and that doesn't make any sense unless that side of her face was wiped. Why was her face wiped? This was not investigated at all. It could be that it was not noticed by investigators. In any event, it raises questions about the veracity of Pistorius' version of what happened. 
What is further puzzling is the fact that there are no footprints, neither from Riva nor from Oscar's prophetic feet, visible anywhere on the scene. That is, it's, it's almost a matter of impossibility. When you look at the amount of blood that um, was found on the um, point where the shooting occurred and where the body was uh, originally found, um, it's impossible that there wasn't anything. It's a, it's a matter of impossibility. If you look at the blood on the prosthetics, if you look at, uh, there should have been uh, um, secondary contact uh, blood marks all over the carpet. He said that he put his prosthesis on with socks on. I haven't seen a picture of the bottom of the socks yet, but it doesn't appear as though they were saturated. And there's blood all over the bathroom floor. And by his own testimony, he goes back into that bathroom and out into the bedroom at least three times, I believe. And we've only got one set of transfer marks going out the door. Um, now, if you weren't replenishing the blood, you would expect that trail to get lighter and lighter and lighter. So we may not have a back and forth pattern, but as he goes back into the bathroom, we would expect the socks to be replenished with blood and potentially see um, the two or three trails coming out of the door. And, and we don't see that. And we don't see identifiable sock patterns on the, on the tiles afterwards either. Thomas Mollett is a crime author and a master's student in forensics. Together with his brother, they offered a book on the Pistorius case. Yeah, well, I must say, the very, probably one of the very first photos I looked at was the one in the bathroom, the bloodied floor. And I looked at it and I thought to myself, look, uh, on Oscar's version, there must be feet mark here, and I'm talking about prosthesis feet. And I looked and I looked and I couldn't find any. Now just remember, something must have touched the, the floor. Are these stumps or his feet? So I looked at the floor and I couldn't find any feet marks. And I zoomed in and I looked and I looked and just suddenly there it was. It seemed to me like swipe marks of, of a stump. It had a certain texture and I looked and I saw some other marks like that as well. In their book, the Mollet surmised that Pistorius was on his stumps most of the time during the incident. They superimposed images of Pistorius on his stumps over drag marks on the floor and claim that the size of the stump corresponds with the size of the drag marks. However, it must be noted that many other expert analysts have rejected this theory. Well, I would challenge the police or whoever, if they, if they dispute this, then bring Oscar's stumps. Like somebody brings their fingerprint, let him bring his stumps and we can compare it to those marks. Whether or not the mullets are correct, the fact remains that seasoned investigators should have noticed the lack of footprints and should have investigated it thoroughly. It was simply not done. Another crucial piece of evidence that was not examined in full was a cricket bat used to break the door down. Every object on a crime scene tells a story, and the crucial implement found on the crime scene, the cricket bat, seems not to have been interrogated at all. Yes, we've got a few different patterns on the bat. As I mentioned, we've got the hair transfer. We've got uh, compression transfer, which is just one bloody thing touching something else. Um, we've got some dripped stains, and this is on the, the top surface as it's originally found in the bathroom. Um, and then when we turn it over, there's an area on the, on the corner that is kind of saturated with blood. Um, as about to about the halfway width of the of the bat, and when we enlarge that, we also see the same sort of um, fat interspersed with that that we did on the floor. Um, and there's there's no corresponding pool of blood underneath it in the bathroom to account for that. So at the very least, we know that the bat has been moved. This is inconsistent with Pasturius's version that he just used the bat to break down the door and then discarded it on the floor. And it seems that other things were moved in the bathroom before the police arrived on the scene. There's a, a panel of, of wood that is between the, the toilet cubicle and the, um, the bathroom area that kind of straddles the, the two. There are some stains on top of it, uh, probably dripped stains, and on the edge of it, it's very, the bottom, what appear, the bottom edge in that photo 
is, is saturated with blood, but underneath it is no pool. So I, I don't know where that original position was. And it's also on top of two of the wipe marks, um, one in the toilet cubicle and one in the bathroom. So that had to come after the wipe marks. And I don't know exactly how that would happen with the door being broken down. It, it would have to happen after he pulled her out somehow. So things have been changed in that scene by who, I don't know. In addition, blood stains that do not match Pistorius' story are found all over the bathroom. Especially the extensive stains indicative of dripped blood are puzzling. The blood source had to be moving over that entire area where we see the, the dripped blood. We know that Riva was the blood source. It could be from a shot occurring outside of the bathroom, or outside of the toilet cubicle, um, or it, they could be falling from her wounds or clothing if they were superficial. So there's, you know, we, we have to be objective and when we look at physical evidence and consider all of the possibilities. And one is, is that she was struck um, outside of the, the toilet cubicle, and another is that they simply fell from her wounds or clothing. Interestingly enough, this is supported by observations by the Mullet brothers regarding blood on the cricket bat. They surmised that there was blood on the cricket bat before it was used to break the door down, as illustrated here in court. They claim a blood smear at the bottom of the bat is indicative of this. On the one corner, there seems to be a very light smear mark. What we can deduce from this is that there was blood on the bed before it entered the door. You can imagine a drop being there, and it enters the door, and the wood would then smear it you know, into this angle. And then there was another deposit. Again, we've got two events here, one event and another event. And, and, and the photo of this was taken when the police arrived, so it wasn't because of police handling. That smear was there when the police arrived. It's clearly visible in a lot of photos. And that would tell us that there was blood on the scene before he broke down the door. This tend to correspond to Zanon's observation that there was some bloodshed in the house prior to the fatal shooting. Something else that also points to this is the fact that on some photographs it seems that there is blood under Riva's feet that should not be there according to Pistorius' version of events. Yes, that's one of the things that we always look at in, um, in homicide cases is if there's blood on the bottoms of the feet or the tops of the feet to help us put them in position. And we know that if there's blood on the bottoms of the feet that they had to be standing or sitting with their feet flat after bloodshed has occurred. So we know that she had to be standing or sitting after blood occurred. There's, there's a pattern on one of her feet that looks like a V that could easily be where two tiles come together. Um, that her, her foot would have been flat on the, on the floor. So we know that she wasn't down instantly. There, there had to be some bloodshed that she stepped in. What did this suggest? That she stepped in blood in the bathroom before she was shot? Was there blood on the scene before the fatal shooting? This possibility was never raised nor investigated. Also puzzling is the very wide distribution of blood drops in the bathroom. There appears to be, we've got very small stains in the jacuzzi all the way over to the sinks. And so that distribution is really not consistent with simply pulling her out of the toilet and then picking her up and taking her downstairs to have that distribution all the way across, the blood source had to be very close to those areas. The blood stains on the sink and in the jacuzzi were quite small and they can only travel a maximum of about one to four feet because they're so small. There was more going on in there than a, simply picking her up and taking her out. There was more movement or, or action in there. From the observations made by the analysts, it's clear that a lot of really crucial evidence was never interrogated. Evidence that seemed to indicate that the whole story of what happened that night was never revealed in court. So, what do the various pieces of evidence uncovered so far reveal? The um, version 
that the accused gave could not possibly have been what it was. Given the whole size, shape, and distribution of that entire scene, it just doesn't make sense that it all happened in the bathroom and all he did was drag her out of the bathroom, pick her up, and carry her downstairs. There's more activity than that. So far, we've seen that the close examination of the crime scene and visible evidence suggests that much more than what Oscar Pistorius revealed went on in that house on the night of the murder. But because of poor police work, his version was never seriously interrogated at the hand of evidence visible on the scene. In the next episode, we continue the examination of the crime scene and encounter the same refrain. The version of events suggested by Pistorius does not match the physical evidence.